Welcome to the complete comparison of every Google smartphone ever, starting at the very inception of Android with the T-Mobile G1. This phone was actually a partnership between Google, HTC, and T-Mobile. And for some perspective, it came out a whole year after the first iPhone. Google was already late to the smartphone game. And so in a way, the T-Mobile G1 had to be better. And sadly, most would agree it wasn't quite. The packaging is a two-tiered affair. We're talking about an age when buying a smartphone was a massive deal. So in the top half, you're getting stuff like some ancient looking earphones, as well as a mini USB cable, even before the micro USB that's on its way out now. There's also a T-Mobile pouch. And to be really honest, the bottom half is even wackier. T-Mobile G1 CD containing the user manual and some really interesting looking stickers. You've got to remember, Google was designing this thing before they knew about the iPhone. And so it's built like a lot of the not so smartphones that came before like the early Blackberries with the slide out keyboard and it shipped with Android 1.0 before Android versions even had nicknames. I also want to thank Easy Skins for sponsoring this video, but we'll get to this. Google's first phone did a lot right, but their second smartphone was a big jump towards what we know today. I should clarify at this point, it took a long time before Google actually started building their own hardware. And so for their early smartphones, they instead nominated another manufacturer to build for them. In this case, HTC. So inside this box, again, Google threw in a pouch, which was just a much more common way of protecting your phone back then. We still got that same mini USB cable, as well as a headset. This is much simpler packaging than last time. And one more thing is a removable battery, completely standard at the time. After their first phone, which had a lot of relics from the non-smart era, by the time this thing came around, the company had a much better idea of what the smartphone should be. So with the HTC Magic, they ditched the physical keyboard and went for a smoother, slimmer chassis, plus Android 1.5 Cupcake. This combination of it being more pocketable and having a better display meant that the phone made waves. Not as many waves as this guy, because yes, Google turned from HTC to Motorola to launch Android 2.0 Eclair. The packaging is unlike any other Google phone, and you could say the same for the device. This thing is pretty wacky. Oh, and the Droid was the first Google phone to use a micro USB. The Droid is badass with its aggressive design, its top tier specifications and premium materials. We're talking about a display with a resolution of 854 by 480. This was class leading at the time. Also, instead of Motorola's not so great Moto Blur UI, you'd be getting a plain Google experience. 2010, Android was booming in popularity, but the one problem Google faced was that each of these manufacturers making Android phones, like Samsung, were loading their own third-party interfaces on top of Google's to the point where Google's base software was almost unrecognizable. So Google introduced Nexus. They teamed up with HTC again to make the Nexus One, pure Google software and sold directly by Google online. So we've got the smartphone on top and below that we've got this is a throwback. We've got a pouch with the original Android logo on it. The Nexus One was a beastly phone. It was a flying start to Google's new lineup. They used a first generation Snapdragon chip and it absolutely flew. And more importantly, the phone got an update which gave it multi-touch, finally. This was a small but also massive thing for Android. We take it for granted now, but everything from zooming in using the camera app to finding a location using Google Maps takes advantage of this. So this was a great phone. It's just a shame that sales didn't take off. The whole idea of paying full price for a phone off contract without getting to try it first like people were used to in stores, it went down like a lead balloon. Also in 2010, we saw T-Mobile's successor to the G1 that kicked everything off. This is the T-Mobile G2. One thing to know is they'd completely redone this hinge mechanism. And I gotta say, I like this one. Although because it wasn't a launch platform for one of Google's new Androids, we'll move on. In fact, 2010 was a crazy year for Google. It wasn't just the year the original Nexus One came out, the year of the T-Mobile G2, but also the year the next Nexus S came out, successor to the Nexus One. Now, I realize that having an S on a phone is nowadays associated with a very small increment, but this was a completely new phone, very much the Nexus Two. And that S in the name signified that instead of working with HTC, Google had shifted to Samsung. And you can tell, it's got a Samsung Super AMOLED panel, Samsung's typical plastic finish they used at the time. And the phone is also very slightly curved. This was Google's way of showing off their new Android 2.3 gingerbread. It looks like Google learned big time from their mistakes with the Nexus One because they made completely sure that you could buy this in stores too. And so it was a big improvement, but what came next really shook things up. 
2011 was the year Samsung launched their all-singing, all-dancing Galaxy S2. It had pretty much the best display you could get on a phone and a dual-core chip that steamrolled the single-core phones before it. This would have been a problem for Google had they not decided to collaborate with Samsung again for the Galaxy Nexus, which is Samsung's Galaxy fused with Google's Nexus. And by this point, Google has massively streamlined the packaging on these phones. Apart from the handset, you're not really getting much else. There's no pouches, there's no CDs, but it is nice to see we have some half-decent earphones in there for the first time. Emphasis on the half. So this phone, in a way, was the best of Samsung and Google. It was one of the very first phones with not just a Super AMOLED panel, but a 720p resolution. Plus, aside from the mediocre camera, it was very well-rounded and came with, quite possibly, Android's biggest overhaul so far, 4.0, or ice cream sandwich. It now had a completely new visual identity centered around the theme hollow, new fonts, new home screens, new icons, everything. And quality of life improvements across the board. Things like being able to drag icons on top of one another to make folders and being able to dismiss notifications with a swipe. The cherry on top here was that the Galaxy Nexus came in at $399, compared to $529 for their last phone. When have you ever seen that happen? It gets more bizarre because the year after, Google partnered with LG for something even more affordable. The Nexus 4, at just $299, was a phone good enough to make people jealous. It has glass on the front and the back in a way that I instantly loved. It was also, in my experience, the first Android phone ever to be completely lag-free, for two reasons. It shipped with Android 4.2 Jelly Bean, for which Google pretty much focused on performance with a scheme called Project Butter. And this was one of the few phones powered by the Qualcomm S4 Pro chip, which was killer. It was a big win for both Google and Qualcomm. For the first time ever, the Android experience was catching up in polish with the iPhone experience. After such a top-notch collaboration with LG, Google continued this with the Nexus 5, and it wasn't as much of a statement as the Nexus 4, coming in at $50 more, but it was a very nice iterative upgrade. So, the phone, compared to the Nexus 4, it bumped the display size from 4.7 inches to 5 inches, and it brought the practically god-tier Snapdragon 800 chip to a still affordable price. The only criticism was its camera. It's kind of easy to forget, given how good the Pixel cameras are, that cameras used to be one of the weaknesses of Google-branded phones. The Nexus 5 was also known as the KitKat phone, being the launch device to use Android 4.4 KitKat. And for me, one of the biggest things here was immersive mode. All of a sudden, developers could use every Pixel available on your device by hiding the navigation keys. Whilst all of this was happening at around the time of the Nexus 4 and the Nexus 5, Google had bought Motorola, and the Nexus 6 was the first fruit from this. Wow. It is big. On one hand, this was easily the most delightful software experience Android had ever seen. Android 5.0 Lollipop ushered in the basis for the material design that's still being used today. Bright colors and subtle animations that made it feel instantly modern. It's just the hardware itself of the Nexus 6 was a little less liked. With a roughly 6-inch display, meaty bezels, and a 10.1mm thickness, it was a tough sell for anyone without large hands. And even with this bulk, the battery life wasn't great. This would have been far easier to swallow if the price hadn't just skyrocketed as well, from about $350 to about $650. God, look at the difference in size. Just for a quick point of reference, Nexus 5, Nexus 6. The size difference is crazy. It was at this point when Google's strategy started shifting. 2014 was the first year where they had a two-device launch strategy, and this is something they've stuck with ever since. Because of their past success with LG, Google tapped into them again for their lower-cost Nexus 5X, and for the top-tier phone, Google gambled. They brought in a new player, Huawei, to build the hardware for this phone. Okay, let's take a look at the 5X first. And I've got to say, this year, Google really stepped up the packaging. This presentation is just way more slick. There's a Nexus card on top, which also doubles as the instruction manual. Plus, this was the year of USB-C, which at the time had some people scratching their heads, but it stood the test of time. The Nexus 5X was an exciting phone, noticeably price constrained with its 1080p LCD display, but at the same time, $379 for the A-grade Snapdragon 808 chip and clean Android 6 Marshmallow software. People were happy. The 6P was a little more polarizing. That was bad. Aside from being a little hard to open, the packaging's fine. It's more the phone design that people had a problem with. 
It was criticised for looking like something out of the Futurama show, although, to be honest, I don't hate it. The way aluminium met glass on the back was new, for sure, but it allowed for better signal transmission. Plus, it housed Google's best camera yet by a long shot. It's also kind of a stepping stone to the two-tone design Google ended up adopting for the Pixel phones. And this phone is a great example of Google not just experimenting, but learning from their past mistakes. Compared to the Nexus 6, this was way more manageable. A smaller display panel, slimmer bezels, and a thinner body. Finally, it was time for the Pixel, the first smartphone designed and developed by Google. And they never made it clear specifically why they made this move, but I could take a good guess. By controlling both the hardware and the software, Google could guide the market, show other manufacturers how to make Android feel its best, but also introduce a little bit more competition to push companies like Samsung to make even better Android phones. And also just hardware sales. Getting people to buy a Pixel locks them into Google's hardware ecosystem, encouraging them to buy things like Google Daydream, Chromecast, and Google Wi-Fi. Anyways, the phone itself was... It was good. It was good. And you can definitely say that Google has found their stride when it comes to presentation. And if you look inside the box, you can tell everything is a little more uniform than with the Nexus line. And Google also started including an adapter to allow you to switch quickly from your old phone. Now, the Pixel looked and felt unlike any Android before it. It was definitely treading the line of looking a little bit like an expensive toy, but you couldn't argue that the build quality wasn't great. And there was now zero compromise with the camera. The Pixel shipped with HDR plus mode, and I'd say this was one of the most important leaps in computational photography in smartphone history. From the moment I started using this feature, I was instantly attached to the phone. It results in photos with both dark and bright areas well exposed. Plus, on the software front, the Pixel launcher was a delight to use. Uniform circular icons, buttery smooth animations, and Google's answer to the iPhone's 3D touch. And I really liked how the company offered unlimited full quality storage if you got one of these phones. This had never been done before. Now, considering how exciting that first Pixel phone was, it's sales were a bit of a slow start. When it comes to phones, people stick to what they know, and Pixel was just the new kid on the block that had to prove itself. It sold around 3 million handsets in the time that Apple sold about 20 million iPhone 7s. So they tried again. The Pixel 2 came with nicer materials, this kind of matte finish on the back, which people liked. It had a dual front-facing speaker and an even better camera. And it still didn't set the sales figures alight. There is a bit of a misconception though. Nobody buys a Pixel, therefore Pixel is a failure. But you've got to remember that A. Google is new to making phones. Very few of these companies are instant successes. B. Google is only selling two versions of one phone at this point, compared to Samsung who has like 50 models a year. And C many Google phones, they're not globally available. A lot of regions that are covered by their competitors are not part of Google's plan. That leads us on to the Pixel 3. You might remember this phone, you saw it about five months before it was actually unveiled. It was the most leaked phone ever at the time, and there were two reasons. To start with, the design leaked, due to, I guess, just too many people being involved with it. But then, with still two months till the launch, a Russian phone dealer called Binshop managed to get the actual devices. They began selling them and distributing across Russian media. So of course, at this point, everything leaked. Anyways, the phone, when it eventually did release, was pretty well received. It was of course even better than the Pixel 2 before it, but I do remember sitting at the launch event of the 3, just wishing Google had made it a bit more balanced. For example, taking standard photos with this camera, incredible, especially at night with the introduction of Google's night sight mode. But if you wanted to take a video or use a zoom or an ultra wide camera, it fell short. Important things like battery life and storage, they also took a back seat and yet again, Pixel 3, not a sales marvel. But in 2019, Google has done something different and I think this could be their best decision yet. As well as their flagship phones, 2019 is the first year they've also released a light phone. In this case, the Pixel 3a. It's a really good phone, and in a way, I feel like Google's software advantage over other companies lends itself well to creating an outstanding mid-range phone better than it does a flagship. They can turn a mid-range processor and mid-range camera hardware into a phone that's fast and one that can take photos rivaling flagship quality. The 3A might be the start of something for Google. Its release completely flipped their hardware sales from being down on previous years to being up, and I can't wait for the next one. And that leads us on to the Pixel 4. And whilst I don't think this is the most competitive phone Google's ever made, I will say this. I love the design direction Google is moving in. 
the matte finish they have running all the way around the sides. The matte finish they have on the back in the other color variants, it makes the phone so much easier to maintain. Anyways, let's get to the comparison. All right, so the process of setting up this many phones from this many generations was, well, to call it long would be a bit of an understatement. I faced what felt like every single issue I possibly could have. Phones being so old, they're no longer supported. Phones which lack the security to actually log into your Google account on, for which I had to create special one-time passcodes for, and just straight up unexplained errors. It's almost embarrassing. I spent all night on this, but the satisfaction when I was done, when these phones were ready to test, unreal. Take a look at this. We're going to quickly start by unlocking each phone to show how the kind of visual design has changed over time. And to start with, it was as simple as just tapping the menu key and you're in. And this evolved into the slide mechanism, which Apple claimed Android stole from them. So Google then switched to a padlock that you had to drag to the edge of a circle to unlock. And then 2012 and onwards, Google has stuck with the simple swipe up. They've slightly adjusted the animations when you do unlock, but the concept of this has stayed the same. The only one major recent change was with the Pixel phones, where they introduce live wallpapers that then start to animate when you get inside. This is a nice touch. I really like this. It brings some life to the phone. Anyways, one of the main reasons we have all these phones together is so that we can compare performance. So I pulled up the Play Store on each of them, or at least all of them that supported it. The Nexus One in 2010 and behind that, none of those phones actually got the Play Store. They're stuck on the Android market, which doesn't work anymore. But you can see how the Play Store's evolved over time. Anyways, benchmarking. And for this, I'm going to use the Passmark benchmarking tool because it's one of the only benchmarks that still supports older versions of Android. Even then, it's still not going to work on those first three phones because those are running super old versions of Android, but we can extrapolate the score for those phones based on the things we know about how powerful their components are. Anyways, watching this performance figure rise through the years is kind of fascinating. You'll see that in 2011, big jump. 2012 again, big jump. Between 2012 and 2010, that's like a three times performance difference. And it continues to rise until 2015, where we get a bit of an unusual drop. This is because the Nexus 5X has an upper mid-range chip, and the bigger Nexus 6P had the Snapdragon 810, which was famous for its overheating. But then after this, Pixel performance skyrocketed, with the latest one in particular, the Pixel 4, being well ahead of the rest. And as we always do on this series, comparing first to last, there is a 130 times performance bump, on this benchmark at least. Now, just before the camera test, I do just want to quickly show you what Easy Skins is about. So I've dropped a color changing chameleon skin on our Pixel 4, and just for comparison, another one of their skins on the iPhone. And this is one of the most affordable ways to get a new look and scratch resistance. Providing you install it right, even the edges, which are usually super finicky with skins, they look really good. Oh yeah, and everything's made in Britain, but with free worldwide shipping. Now for the camera test. And actually, while we're here, while you can see each of these phones lined up with their back facing upwards, there is one thing I'd say. I generally think the design has gotten better each year. There's a couple of exceptions, a couple of strange decisions, but I do like the direction Google has gone in, and their Pixel lineup especially is a massive jump over what came before. Now, I still have the problem of how exactly I was going to transport 15 phones together to go and do a camera test with, and I settled on using... well, okay, it's actually just a box. Anyways, the way I like to do these comparisons is by starting with a photo taken on the very first phone, and then cycling through the years, taking the same shot with its successes, and seeing how the HDR, how the colors, how the contrast has improved over time. And then right at the end, once we've gone through them, we'll flash back to the beginning. So this right here is T-Mobile G1 on the left-hand side, and Google Pixel 4 on the right. We'll try again with a different set of photos, and let's see if you agree with me here. I think Google's biggest improvement happened with the Nexus 6 in 2014. And after this, the camera has had a whole load of new modes and features, but the base quality of the image has not changed too much. Of course, comparing first to last is a big difference, but maybe not as big as you were expecting. Where you will see a massive difference, though, is at nighttime. See, phones barely improved in this category. It was almost like an unobtainable feature to be able to shoot bright shots in the night for many years until Night Sight came along. And the Pixel 2, Pixel 3, and Pixel 4 are well ahead of the rest. Comparing first to last here is literally night and day. With selfie cameras, the first four didn't even have one, and then after this, pretty subtle improvements for the first few years, with I'd say the biggest jump coming in 2015 with the Nexus 6P. 
After this, of course, the pixels were slightly better, and with the latest Pixel 4, Google made the standard main front camera a wider lens to fit more people in. So that's every Google smartphone ever, and again, a massive thanks to Easy Skins for making it all possible. They've got the widest collection of skins on the market, and they've literally just won the Queen's Award for Enterprise, which I don't think any other phone accessory company has done before. So check them out, link is in the description. And thanks a lot for watching, I'll catch you next time.